Hi, my name's Louise. I'm one of the nutritionists at Connolly's Red Mills. And in this video, we're going to take a detailed look at a condition that I know many of you are concerned about, and that is laminitis. Laminitis affects somewhere between 7 to 13% of horses, and unfortunately, it's often a reoccurring problem. So let's start by taking a quick look at what laminitis actually is. So within the horse's hoof, there are structures called laminae, and they're almost like Velcro, and they hold the hoof wall to the pedal bone. In an episode of laminitis, the laminae become inflamed, and this is excruciatingly painful. In some cases, the bonds actually fail, and as a result, there may be sinking or rotation of the pedal bone. And in, a, in some of those cases, the horse will actually be left permanently lame, and in a smaller percentage, it's actually kinder to put that horse to sleep, unfortunately. There are lots of different signs of laminitis, and some horses may display only mild signs, whereas others will have very severe and obvious signs. But the type of things to look out for are difficulty walking, particularly on a hard surface. The horse may look uncomfortable and be shifting their weight from one foot to another. The hooves can feel hot to the touch and there could be an increase in the digital pulse and pain also in the hoof when they're tested with hoof testers. And then in some cases, they'll have the classic laminitic stance where the horse is almost sitting back on their hindquarters trying to take weight off their front feet. There are lots of different causes to laminitis, and these can broadly be classified into three main categories. The first is laminitis that is associated with a disease or an inflammation. So the type of thing that can, can result in laminitis include retained placenta and colitis, or the classic scenario where a horse breaks into a feed room, um, gorges themselves on feed, and you get a starch overlaid induced laminitis. And all of these are inflammatory type laminitis. The second category is the mechanical overload laminitis. Typically, this is where one limb um, is injured, like, for example, a, a fracture. Um, and you're going to increase the risk of laminitis in the other limbs, which are then bearing all the weight. And most commonly, you see laminitis in the foot opposite uh, the one, the leg that's been, been injured. And then finally, we, we have metabolic or endocrine laminitis, and these are relating to insulin resistance. So we most commonly see them in horses with equine metabolic syndrome, but also quite a large percentage of Cushing's horses um, also have insulin resistance. So they're going to be at increased risk of laminitis too. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at insulin and what it does in both a healthy horse and what happens in insulin resistance or insulin dysregulation as it's now called. <clears throat> so in a healthy horse, <clears throat> when they eat non-structural carbohydrates, so that starch and sugar from either forage or from their hard feed, it gets broken down in the small intestines into glucose. Um, as blood glucose levels rise, the pancreas is triggered to produce the hormone insulin. And insulin's job is really to push the uh, glucose into the body cells where it's either used as energy or it's stored for later use. In insulin resistance or insulin dysregulation, <clears throat> this goes wrong effectively because the cells become unresponsive to insulin. So they start to ignore the signals insulin is sending. So what happens in these cases is that more and more insulin is produced leading to a condition uh, called hyperinsulinemia, which effectively means high levels of insulin in the blood. Now, we're not entirely sure why insulin dysregulation results in laminitis. There are a number of theories out there at the moment, but certainly we know that this is perhaps the most common form of laminitis, um, causing around about 80% of cases is related to metabolic endocrine laminitis. So what do you do if you go out to your paddock one day and you find that your horse has laminitis? Well, the first thing to obviously do is to give your vet a call. Your vet will probably recommend that you bring them in and put them on a nice deep bed so that they're a little bit more comfortable. 
don't starve them and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a in a moment provide them with hay and water and make sure that the hay and water isn't somewhere that they can access it a lot of these ponies they won't want to move they might be very sore they may even be lying down so make sure that the hay and the water is within reach and then your vet will hopefully be able to to come and, and give you some further advice on that horse's management for the immediate um, period where they have developed laminitis. For this video we are going to focus very much on metabolic laminitis and the biggest risk factor for metabolic laminitis is horses being slightly overweight or even obese. Now that's not to say that underweight horses or horses at normal body weight, they can develop insulin resistance, but it's far rarer for um, them to have laminitis um, or metabolic laminitis than it is for horses that are carrying a little bit too much congestion. So we're gonna focus specifically on that group where they, they gain weight easily and they're perhaps a little bit um, overly heavy. So why do horses become overweight? Well, it's exactly the same reasons that we become overweight. They're consuming too many calories for what they need. They're maybe not doing the level of exercise that they need um, either. So you've got a mismatch in calorie intake and exercise levels. Modern management also plays a role. You know, the horse is designed to lose weight in the winter and gain it back in the spring. And sometimes we don't allow that to happen. We like our horses looking well all year round. Genetics undoubtedly plays a role. You know, native type ponies do have that thrifty gene where they, they hold on to, to body weight very, very well. And also owner perception is a factor as well. We have got used to seeing horses that are carrying a little bit uh, more weight um, and that's considered normal. And unfortunately, even in some equestrian disciplines, um, it's considered an advantage. Um, so, you know, we, we have got used to seeing them slightly over-conditioned um, in many parts of the equine industry. So we're now going to move on to how to manage a horse or pony prone to metabolic laminitis. And really we need to consider three different things. So we need to look at their, their body weight, their diet and also their lifestyle. And we're going to talk through each of these sections in turn, starting with body weight. So the first thing you need to, to bear in mind is that it's important to know your horse's body weight and also their condition score. So if you have access to one of the lovely wave bridges, um, maybe your vet has one, by all means, means use that. Most of us don't have access to that. So the equine wave tapes can be really useful. And although they may not give you a really accurate reading, it will help you establish whether they're gaining or losing weight. And then the other thing you can do is to learn how to condition score your horse so that you're assessing the amount of fat cover um, that they're carrying. If you're not sure how to body condition score, you can visit our website and download our handy body condition scoring uh, chart. And that uses the 0 to 5 system. Um, there are other systems out there, but I find this system the easiest system to use. The 0 to 5 system divides the horse into three areas. So you're looking at the neck, um, then you're looking at the, the ribs and the back and finally the hindquarter. And what you're doing is you're feeling for the amount of fat cover. With horses prone to metabolic laminitis, you need to be particularly conscious of regional uh, fatty deposits. So often they will develop perhaps a crusty neck or even a fat pad behind the, the shoulder. So pay particular attention to any regional fatty deposits and ultimately you're aiming for them to have a condition score of really around about three out of five. Um, you don't really want them greater than that for a significant period of time because that will increase the risk of metabolic laminitis. Bear in mind that fat and muscle are two different tissues and they can't be turned, you can't turn fat into muscle or vice versa. So to create a lovely strong outline and good top line, what you want to do is build up muscle tone. 
if your horse is currently slightly overweight, then what we need to focus on is getting them to lose weight steadily and at the same time building up that muscle tone so that you're creating a strong outline using muscle, not fat. And look, this does take time. It takes time and effort to build up muscle tone. I just wanted to show you here, these are some pictures from Chloe Slater sent us. So the first picture is um, when she got a new horse. It arrived uh, from Germany. And as you can see, it really hasn't got any muscle tone along its bottom. A month later, with correct exercise and diet, this horse looks far, far better. It's got a lovely rounded bottom. Still got a little bit to go, um, but it's definitely going the right direction. So it just shows you what um, some structured exercise can really make a difference to a horse's outline. So my top tips are really to monitor body weight and condition score regularly. Every two weeks um, is a good idea and that will just help you to notice any changes and address them early on. When you're condition scoring, pay particular attention to abnormal fatty deposits, perhaps a crusty neck or a fat pad behind the shoulder. And taking some photos can be a great way of helping you to monitor changes over time. You know, we see our horses every day, so sometimes it can be difficult to notice little changes. But if you take photos both from the side and the back on a regular basis, hopefully you'll be able to see those changes over time. The next area we want to focus on when we're managing metabolic laminitis is diet. I mentioned earlier on, it's absolutely critical that we never starve the laminitic horse or pony. Remember, these horses are unwell and they need nutrients to recover. Also, starvation will slow down metabolism and it can lead to a life-threatening condition called hyperlipemia. And that's when the body goes into starvation mode and it releases fat um, stored in the body in order to keep its vital organs functioning. Um, this results in huge amounts of fat being present in the bloodstream and that can cause failure of other vital organs such as the liver. So never starve your horse or pony. And the first thing we need to think about when we're feeding any horse is forage. Obviously, we know that low forage diets can lead to behavioural type problems like cribbing. Um, the horse has an innate desire to want to chew on something all the time. So if we don't provide something for them to chew on, they'll find something else to chew. It can also uh, contribute to digestive problems like gastric ulcers and colic. So ideally, we want to be providing forage ad lib if you can. Now, if you have to restrict forage, that should be to no less than one and a half percent of body weight on a dry matter basis. The real aim is to provide plenty of forage, but limit the calories that that forage is providing. And I'm gonna give you some tips now on how you can do that. Before we go on to the tips, uh, just bear in mind that um, grass is not fresh air. Um, grass is a common forage fed to, to horses, but it can be very high in calories and sugar. So that may not be appropriate for the laminitic. And actually there's probably no safe grass for a horse prone, prone to laminitis. You may need to manage their access to pasture very, very carefully. How can you control grass intake? Well, look, there's lots of, of techniques out there. I'm a big fan of the strip grazing or the paradise paddock. For those of you who haven't heard of a paradise paddock, that is where you put the electric fence effectively inside your uh, field and create a track around the outside. Um, and that just means that the horses are walking around a little bit more to consume the, the grass. Um, I have seen people put obstacles like logs or even trotting poles to make the environment a little bit more interesting as well. So I'm a big fan of, of the Paradise Paddock. If you can't use techniques like that, then you can muzzle horses. But just be aware of a couple of things. A, you need to make sure that they can eat and drink through the muzzle. And B, if you take the muzzle off for a period of time, just be aware that some of these horses can then go and gorge themselves on grass. And that can obviously be undesirable in terms of managing the laminitic. If you can't do any of these things, and, and sometimes it's not possible um, if you're on a shared yard, 
But think about things like you could go in and cut the grass and remove it so that it's not there. Increasing the stocking density, so more horses on one pasture, so that there's not as much grass available. Or the starvation paddocks where you may have zero grazing, perhaps a wood chip area um, that your horse can be turned out on, but they will need additional forage in the form of hay if you're using a starvation paddock. That leads us quite nicely on to hay. Um, ideally, you want to try and choose a low calorie, late cut hay for a laminitic horse or pony. The other things you can do to reduce the calorie and sugar content of the hay is to soak it. Now, typically I recommend soaking for around nine hours, um, although in very warm weather, you might want to reduce this to six hours. You can also consider mixing the hay with a little oat or a barley straw. Um, there's a couple of things you need to, to just be aware of before you do that. Firstly, your horse has to have good dental um, condition. Straw is quite tough to chew, so it may not be um, ideal for an older horse with poor teeth. Um, and secondly, you need to introduce it gradually. So I tend to recommend no more than 30% of the forage uh, portion of the ration is made up of straw, um, although in some cases you may go up to six, uh, 50% although you probably need to discuss that with your vet and nutritionist before doing it. So introduce it gradually, check dental condition, um, and yeah, still can be a really useful alternative forage. And other things you can do are simply using two small old hay nets, one inside each other, just to slow down eating and extend the time that, that the horse has that hay for, that they're not devouring it all in one go, and it's gonna keep them occupied and keep that trickle feeding for a little bit longer. I mentioned just there that soaking will reduce um, the calorie content, but it will also reduce some of the other uh, nutrients in hay. So in this graph, it's a study done by uh, Moore Collier, just showing the losses of sodium, potassium and phosphorus over time. So they started um, soaking the hay uh, at zero hours, then at half an hour they measured it again at three hours and 12 hours. And you can see that over time there was a steady decrease in the mineral content of the, the hay. Why is that important? Well, those minerals need to be replaced somehow in the diet. And that's where your hard feed comes in. Your hard feed is there to balance the forage portion of the diet. And grazing, even well-managed grazing, particularly restricted grazing and hay, will not provide adequate levels of micronutrients. So your concentrate feed is really going to be there to ensure that they get sufficient quality protein for tissue repair and muscle development, and also optimum levels of all the essential vitamins and minerals, including antioxidants and biotin, which are really important for horses and ponies with parental laminitis. The feed I recommend for, for good doers prone to laminitis is Red Mill's Performa Care Balancer. So that is a nutrient dense balancer, rich in essential micronutrients, including amino acids, antioxidants, um, and vitamins and minerals. It's non-heating, cereal grain free, and contains just 3% starch. It also contains our unique care package, which includes a long lasting natural gastric acid buffer, added yeast, and two prebiotics, which are gonna help to support hindgut function and health. It also contains elevated levels of biotin to support healthy hoof growth. Performa Care Balancer can be bought through your Red Mill stockist or um, you can buy it online and it will be delivered to your yard. So I typically recommend Performa Care Balancer for horses that are on a calorie controlled diet because they, you don't need to feed very much of it to get all the essential micronutrients that your horse needs. It can be used as a sole feed uh, for horses that are doing well on a forage based diet or if needed you can use it to top up um, another mix of food if you find that your horse does need more calories. So that might be the case for example in a horse that has um, Cushing's and is perhaps losing a little bit of condition, you might feed Performa Care alongside another low starch feed to help them to gain weight safely. 
The recommended feeding guide for Performer Care Balancer for horse and light work is 100 grams per 100 kilos body weight. So roughly that's about two coffee mugs, two heap coffee mugs for a 15 hand 500 kilo horse. So when we're managing diet for equine um, equine horses prone to laminitis, um, the top tips are don't starve them, potentially limit the grass intake um, and manage that very carefully. If you're feeding hay, consider soaking it for 12 hours or potentially mixing it with a little oat of barley straw, provided the horse's teeth are okay and it's done gradually. And then in terms of your hard feed, choose a nutrient dense balancer such as Connolly's Red Mills Performer Care Balancer. And I also recommend getting out your kitchen scales and, and weighing your, your feed. Um, you don't want to be feeding too much because that's adding calories unnecessarily. And equally, if you're not feeding enough, then your horse won't be receiving all the vital micronutrients um, that they should be. The final section I just want to talk about very briefly is lifestyle, um, because that also plays a role in managing horses prone to metabolic laminitis. So the first is exercise. Obviously, the more exercise you can do, the better, provided your horse isn't lame and isn't currently suffering from laminitis. So long, slow work is going to aid weight loss. Um, and also, it actually reduces insulin resistance. And that, that effect is seen before you may even notice uh, weight loss occurring. So it, it really is beneficial to exercise your horses um, daily if you can. But bear in mind that overweight horses will find work harder um, and they may feel less energetic to start with and then again every time you step up the training but that will improve if you persevere once their fitness levels catch up you'll find that their energy levels um, get a little bit better um, but just bear that in mind it, you know it is tough if they're carrying a little bit of extra weight to start with um, but 30 minutes a day um, exercise really can make a huge amount of difference um, to your horse. The other thing, and I mentioned this earlier on, is that the winter um, is a great time for weight loss. Horses naturally would lose weight in the winter and then safely regain it in the spring. So if your horse has got a little too heavy over the spring and summer months, use the winter to help you facilitate weight loss. If, they, uh, if you can, or if they're rugged, consider using uh, a lighter weight rug so that they're using up some calories, keeping warm. Also consider if they're not already doing so, can they live out? Um, stabling slows down metabolism, if they're not moving around as much. So if it is possible for your horse to live out over the winter, then that is certainly something to consider. Obviously, you also need to be cautious there with your grass intake. Even though it's not going to be as high in calories and sugar in the winter, it's still something that you need to be conscious of. <clears throat> So my top tips are increase workload if you can, at least 30 minutes a day should be your, your goal. Uh, keep a workload diary. Um, that can be really useful so that you actually see how much work uh, you are doing with your horses. You know, we're all busy and some days it may not be possible to, to exercise your horse, um, but if those days seem to be happening more and more, then that could possibly be contributing to your horse's weight gain and therefore risk of metabolic laminitis. And remember uh, to be patient and just persevere. Um, things will pay off, but it does take a little bit of time. So finally, my five sort of take home messages for managing the risk of metabolic laminitis is to weigh and condition score your horse every couple of weeks. Choose a low calorie forage, whether that's um, soaked hay or hay with a mixture of oat or barley straw. Increase exercise. Um, aiming for at least 30 minutes a day. Weigh your feed so that you know you're feeding the recommended level and not too little or too much. And finally, if you are looking for a low calorie, nutrient dense feed, then our Performer Care Balancer is an excellent product. And if you need more help and support with your horse's individual diets, then contact us via our website. Um, you can contact Ask the Experts and one of our nutrition team will get back to you and help put together a bespoke diet plan for your individual horse's needs.